Hello everyone and welcome back to Narnia Lore. Today I bring you one of the biggest fan fictions I have ever written. And I am super excited to bring this to you. I've worked extremely hard on this and I think you guys will really enjoy this. In the last battle, King Trinian says to the High King, If I have read the Chronicle aright, there should be another. Has not your majesty two sisters? Where is Queen Susan? The High King, King Edmund, Lady Jill, and the Lady Polly proceed to explain that Susan purposefully has forgotten about Narnia, referring to it as a kid's game. She was more interested now in, quote, nylons, lipstick, and invitations, as Jill put it. And Lady Polly states that, quote, her whole idea is to rush on to the silliest time of one's life as quick as she can, and then stop there for as long as she can, end quote. Now, we could argue for pretty much the rest of our lives as to why Susan turned her back on all of that, but I don't want to do that in this video. Instead, I want to see what happened in England after the train crash. So without further ado, ladies and gentlemen, let's get into it. Susan was completely devastated after she received the news of not only her siblings' deaths, but also of her parents. This drove Susan into a deep depression over the next few months, which eventually led to her developing a drinking problem, frequenting nightclubs almost every night, and then showing up to the department store where she worked with a massive hangover. One of her co-workers and close friend, Adela Pennyfeather, saw this problem and tried to help her, taking her to see psychologists, psychiatrists, and even visiting several reverends, but nothing seemed to work. Susan seemed to just be giving up on her life, letting herself go both mentally and physically. Susan couldn't stand that she was the only surviving Pevensey, and to boot, most, if not all of her friends were already married, some even had children. But there she was, 21 years old, with no siblings, no parents, no husband, not even a boyfriend, and no children. One morning, Susan woke up as usual and got dressed for work. When she arrived, however, Adela said that a young man had just been there looking for Susan. Susan almost couldn't believe what she had heard and asked Adela if she had got his name. However, she said he didn't say, but he did say that he would be back tomorrow. Susan was so intrigued by this that she was distracted on the job all day. As she got off work that evening, she was so curious about who this man was, she didn't even think about going to the nightclub. Instead, she went home ate it some dinner, and then went to bed. The next morning, Susan arrived at work early, asking Adela if she had seen the young man. Adela said she hadn't, so Susan began her work as usual, keeping her eyes and ears peeled. As she was restocking the men's shoe section, she heard someone behind her say her name. Turning around, she came face to face with a handsome young man about her age. She greeted him and asked him if he was the one that asked her about her yesterday. He said that he was, and he introduced himself as Alan Gentrick. Susan then recognized that he was the nephew of Professor Kirk, the man who had housed the Pevensey children in the country during the war. The four Pevensey children spent hours playing outside with Alan during that time, and eventually attended the same school after they had gone back to London. Alan told Susan that he had heard about what happened with the train accident and wanted to offer his condolences. Thanking him, Susan tried to assure him that she was doing quite well, despite the shocking news. Alan, however, who was studying to become an investigator, could tell that this was not true. But he decided not to say anything, and instead asked Susan if she would like to have dinner with him that night. Susan said she would be delighted to, and she wrote her apartment number and, and her telephone number down for him. Alan said he would pick her up around 7 o'clock. Susan was so giddy with excitement, she had trouble focusing on work for the rest of that day. But finally, five o'clock rolled around, and they were able to close the department store for the day. She rushed home as quickly as she could in order to change and be ready when Alan arrived to pick her up. As she put the finishing touches onto her makeup, a gentle knock sounded at the front door. Susan's heart jumped and began to race. Feverishly, she finished up what she was doing, gathered her things, and opened the door. Ellen smiled and told her that she looked lovely. Blushing, she thanked him for his kind compliment. He stood there for a moment, her old friend looking deep into her baby blue eyes. Slowly, a massive tear began to form in Susan's eye, and 
He eventually spilled out, rolling down her soft cheek, splashing onto her shoe. Alan pulled out his handkerchief and gently wiped her eyes, then asked her what was wrong, leading her to the stairs and sitting her down. Susan was able to explain to him through her sobs about what had happened during the past few months concerning her depression, her self-malnutrition, and her drinking problem. Alan sat and listened patiently, wiping her tears away whenever they started to run down her cheek. When she was done, Alan gently wrapped his arms around her, reassuring her that he was available to help her if she needed it. Susan thanked him, leaning her head on his chest and letting her last few sobs work themselves out. Finally, Susan was able to stop crying and apologize for her meltdown. Alan assured her that it was quite all right, and she asked him if he'd be patient enough to let her retouch her makeup before they went out. That night, Susan had the best time she'd had in a long time. The two had a wonderful dinner, followed by a bit of dancing, which was then followed by a long walk in the moonlight. Finally, as Alan dropped her off at her apartment, Susan turned and kissed Alan on the cheek, thanking him for such a wonderful evening. Alan asked her if he could call on her later. Susan said yes, and with that, Alan left. When Susan woke up the next morning, the sun seemed to be brighter, the birds seemed to sing louder, and she walked with more of a spring in her step. Her performance at work had improved, and she felt as if a great weight had been lifted off her shoulders. She continued to see Alan for the next few months. During this time, the two old friends filled each other in on the things that had happened since they had last met back in 1945. The next month, on Christmas Eve of 1949, Alan invited Susan to his uncle's house to spend Christmas with his family. Susan said she'd love to. Snow was gently falling as Alan pulled up to Susan's apartment to drop her off. Susan then asked Alan if he would mind taking a walk with her. Alan, of course, agreed, and the two began to walk slowly through the snow. Reaching an old street lamppost, the two stopped for a moment, gazing at the snow flying in a fury around them. Susan shivered, her teeth chattering loudly. Alan quickly took off his greatcoat and wrapped it around her, rubbing her arms gently to try and warm her up. She smiled at this sweet gesture and looked up staring deep into Alan's hazel eyes. Alan then bent down slowly and gently touched his lips to hers. Susan closed her eyes, returning his kiss. Drawing back, they both smiled at each other, then began to laugh as they realized that a little girl was watching through a nearby window. Waving awkwardly, the couple decided that that was enough for one night, and Alan walked Susan back home. On March 28th of 1950, Alan and Susan were finally married in a little church not too far from where Alan's uncle lived. The couple then toured all over Europe for their honeymoon, coming back around to tour Scotland where Alan's grandparents were from. One evening, Alan walked into the family room to find Susan hard at work typing something out. Giving his wife a gentle shoulder rub, Alan looked at what she was writing. And although there was no title yet, the first line read, Once there were four children, named Peter, Susan, Edmund, and Lucy. So guys, what do you think of this fan fiction? Please leave your thoughts in the comments down below. I'd love to hear you guys' feedback on this. Do you think maybe it would have turned out a different way? I think this is actually quite a nice fan fiction, as it, at the end it kind of harks to Susan is finally remembering Narnia and kind of sort of revealing that she actually wrote the Chronicles of Narnia. So it's, uh, I think it's definitely a nice fan fiction. So like I said earlier, just let me know what you guys think in the comments. And as always, if you have any suggestions on what you want to see next, please leave that in the comments as well. If you're new here, please consider subscribing to the channel for more exciting Narnia lore. And do make sure to hit that like button as it really does help out the channel. So, my fellow Narnians, until next time, this is Narnia Lore.